Hello, welcome aboard Historic Ship Nautilus. I'm Commander Brad Boyd, Director of Stormy Force Museum and Officer in Charge of Historic Ship Nautilus. This week, we continue our video series, Behind the Scenes of Nautilus, with the staterooms. Now, last week we covered the wardroom, and I have one outstanding question I answer online, because it's a little complicated to try to answer uh, just, just with text. Uh, so, we're going to uh, talk about what china was used on board Nautilus, and then has the display ever swapped. So, the first question, what was used on board Nautilus? Um, it may have been this, so which is a gold circle, it's light blue circle, and, and next, another gold circle fall, uh, with a, a gold officer emblem at top. Very common in today's Navy. It's been used on all the submarines that I've served on. Um, may or may not have been in use when Nautilus was in service. Um, another option would have been uh, the Blue China Plate. Uh, Blue China is the company we call the Blue China Plate, which would have been very similar plate design, just with one uh, blue circle around the outside. May or may not have had a blue circle on the inside, based off of what year and what version you got, and a blue anchor at the top. Uh, the Blue China Plate was very popular in the Cold War because the company had a... Uh, uh, contract Department of Defense for most of the branches, if not all of them, uh, throughout most of the Cold War to provide the China for the bases and the ships and anyone else that may need the China. Um, we have both sets here, uh, only uh, the one that you see on the table uh, at Nautilus, the other one's in our collections facility. Uh, I do not have a record since it's not an artifact, it's just purchased out of the Navy supply system. I have no records on it. Uh, for uh, when we've had it on display or where it's been uh, during the time that it's here. Uh, so I wish I had a better answer for when the display could have swapped out. If it did, unfortunately, I just don't have those records as they're not artifacts. Um, and I have no institutional memory from my uh, civ civilian staff that are here. would be the long-leg institutional memory here. They don't remember swapping it out. And if the crew did it, uh, it's been at least eight years that it's been here. And we know that based off of who's been here and come back to, to work here at Nautilus. Uh, so I'd say it's been at least eight years since the display swap, if one happened. I just don't have records one way or the other, and I, I apologize, wish I had a better answer, just not something I'm very able to keep here. But with that, I hope I can answer any other questions a little bit better. Uh, we're going to go on to the staterooms, and uh, on with the tour today. Thanks. Now, as I said, the tour today will be of the staterooms. Staterooms where the officers would sleep, also where they uh, conduct all office work, their administrative side of the job. Uh, Serums on board Nautilus are fairly similar to that of a submarine today. Uh, they're varying sizes, and I'll point that out a little bit, but for the most part, uh, all staterooms are about the same throughout the classes of submarines. It's just the specific layout would change just a touch, number of people assigned to it, uh, actual amount of space uh, within may vary by upwards of uh, five, six, maybe ten square feet, that type of thing. So here we have staterooms one and two. And down the hall on the left is stateroom three and four. And on the right there, that's the COXO uh, staterooms. And we're going to go to all of these. So as you come in, and you see here that uh, the stateroom would house the entire contents of uh, the two officers assigned here. Uh, it would fit within the drawers beneath uh, there or under the desk that you see there. And this actually pulls out. I'll show you that in a minute. Under that there in those drawers. Uh, and then also they would have all their office equipment need to fit in here. So books, technical manuals, uh, supplies. Uh, you'd have a safe to hold uh, sensitive information. So, for example, fitness reports, evaluations. You don't want people to have everyone else's uh, evaluation reports. Uh, any classified material that needs to be stored. She is or she was an active duty warship and would have duck, conducted uh, missions that are sensitive. So all those would be stored in here. So... Uh, as I said, this opens up, so there we go. So look into basically a locker. And then, uh, for example, this is a, actually a pull down sink. So you'd have a sink in the stateroom. This way you could uh, shave, brush teeth, what, whatever you need to do. Medicine cabinet directly above. Very similar to what you could get at a store today, really. Um, and this pull down sink that you see, I had these almost exact the uh the drain changed just a touch and uh the spigot changed uh, the faucet changed just a little bit but i had the pretty much the exact same drop down sink on a 688 class submarine los angeles class submarine so all right so here we're going in stateroom two now stateroom two is probably a junior officer stateroom so junior officer is like a first or second tour 
officer is not actually assigned to a uh, department. Uh, this is back in uh, terms of what Nautilus manning would have been. So here's the top rack here. Uh, so this one actually has a couple of lockers in it. Probably not for personal storage, probably for supplies. But if supply didn't need it, they could use it for their own. Uh, book locker up top, whatever items they need for that. So middle rack. And then the bottom rack. Uh, so that right there is not a puka or a locker. That is a uh, document holder. So we put a photograph of a loved one there. Whatever it is. We'll go there and then down to the bottom. So, drop down sink, pretty common in all the uh, staterooms that you're going to see. And then, uh, wardrobe. That's what that locker right there is as well. Fold down desk. Safe to keep whatever material you need to keep in there. Locker above, pretty standard as you've already seen. So, okay, we're gonna go on to staterooms three and four now. So, I'm just finished with stateroom two. Stateroom three, uh, like stateroom two, is probably more of a junior officer stateroom, the first uh, officer tour you come on board. Um, just based on the fact that it's also a three person layout, it's got an extra desk, which is nice. So, as you can see right here. Um, but it's pro it's a, probably the junior office stateroom as they share a little bit more um, and the department heads would take the uh, two-man staterooms uh, a little more space to spread out as well as a little more space for them to hold all the uh, manuals and uh, records that they have to have. But each boat could have done it differently and each, uh, each wardroom, uh, each officer grouping could have had it different requirements as one comes in and says I'd rather be here and be senior enough he gets his pick as to where, he sit, where he's going to sleep. So uh, once again bed rack with lockers most likely used for storage of parts but could have been used for storage of uh, personal effects if the parts weren't needed uh, then you have over here a uh, wardrobe closet uh, same thing right there another wardrobe closet uh, as once again you had three officers in here so they might have had to spread out a little bit more uh, various lockers around store whatever needs to be stored uh, there's a mirror one on the other side the uh, next room you'll see which actually goes in that space medicine cabinet, technical manuals, all of that. All right, so now we're gonna go on to stateroom four, and I'm pretty sure that this was the engineer stateroom. Um, so as we're going over there, I'm gonna talk to you about some of the uh, requirements uh, that are filled by each of the various departments. Okay, so one of the departments is the engineering department, as we're about to go into that stateroom, I'll talk about that first. The engineering department is responsible for all things that do with making Nautilus go. It's like Nautilus light and power. Um, as well as sanitation. Uh, so they involve propulsion, they're involved in uh, power generation, power distribution, uh, water movement, hydraulic movement, um, as well as, uh, and water movement would also include the sanitation, so all the, all the heads, all the bathrooms on the ship get serviced that way, all the trim and drain systems on the ship go that way, the drain system for and water supply system to or from the galley all goes uh, serviced by uh, the engineering department. So they do everything that makes the basic functions of a submarine to make it a survive, uh, livable ship and a home for people for uh, months at a time work. So that's engineering department. Then you're going to have navigation operations. Um, and they're going to do all navigation aspects. That one's pr pretty obvious. Um, so they own the quartermasters, which is the Navy term for a uh, uh, somebody who plots ship's course, uh, determines position, helps... Uh, manage charts because a chart gets published it doesn't mean it's up to date uh the it's, for the rest of its life you have to perform updates to that chart so as uh wrecks are found uh sounding anomalies are determined and all of that he would run uh navigation operations runs radar it would run esm electronic signals measurements we'll talk about that in a later episode and uh navigation operations would also run um uh, interior communication so that phone that you see right there and i'll come back to that in a second as well as uh, uh, interior interior um, indications for uh, equipment, uh, for uh, uh, heading course, so they own the ship's compasses, the ship's uh, gyro, gyro or magnetic, and uh, they also would own uh, communications off the ship. So uh, radio would be done by uh, navigation operations. So that phone that we're looking at right now, that is a sound-powered phone. So sound-powered phones were the Navy's answer to how do you talk throughout a ship without requiring electricity in case you lose your electrical distribution capability. So the sound-powered phone works the exact same way 
as a, a string can between two points does. So put, take a tin can, tie a string uh, at one end of it, uh, punch a hole, put a string on it, hold it tight to the, another can with the exact same. And if you do that, you can talk through it because the vibration goes through the string. So it's a very similar concept for how the sound-powered phones work. Um, although you don't have to hold the cord tight because it's done through an internal process. This is why I know this is probably the engineer's rack, and therefore the engineer's stateroom, because he's the only one that has a phone in his rack and he has to talk back to maneuvering at the other end of the ship and needs to be able to do so at a moment's notice to talk about ship's conditions, answer questions, if they have a casualty, get an update, all those types of things. So that why that, that's why that phone is there. Um, look through the rest. So lockers, you can see some manuals in here. Briefcase for carrying it, so uh, antenna turning group. So it's probably the nav operations officer and the engineer shared this stateroom uh, based off just the manuals in here. Although, once again, they could have laid out however uh, they wanted to in terms of who is where. More lockers up there, another rack to hold books and manuals, uh, records, whatever needs to be done uh, throughout. This is that mirror locker I was telling you about on the other side. So that's this wall right there. That's actually stateroom three. Okay. Uh, so the other department that uh, we haven't talked about yet, or the two actually, are weapons. So weapons department owns the onloading, offloading, handling of all weapons on board, be they torpedoes, mines, or be they small arms. So that's weapons department. They would also own sonar, so the listening for uh, uh, other contacts out there, uh, safe navigation with a pedometer, uh, those types of things. Uh, it's all sonar equipment, and we'll come to sonar when we get uh, next week or the week after. And then uh, fire control, um, so plotting of contacts, uh, getting a firing solution on a contact, uh, that would all be done by the weapons department. Last department is the supply department. Now the supply department, like any other aspect of the military, is 100% essential to the function of the ship. Um, military operations succeed based off the strength of the logistics. So if you can't have a good logistics, you can't operate away from port. So supply is 100% essential. They are... Uh, comprised of the cooks or mess specialists, depending on what time uh, the Navy you're talking about. Um, and then they also have the logistics or storekeepers, depending on what time of the Navy you're talking about. Um, so cooks and mess specialists obviously cook the food um, and uh, deal with all aspects of the galley. And then um, the logistics or storekeepers uh, deal with all the parts and supplies requirements for the ship. So they're the uh, single point of contact to get parts onto or off of the ship. So uh, on to CX Stateroom with that quick pit stop. Now the pit stop is to show you a book that was presented to Commander Anderson when he was commanding officer of the Nautilus in October of 1957 for uh, her having traveled under the sea for 20,000 leagues and having gone under a polar ice cap. Now she had not made it all the way to the North Pole yet, uh, but she had ventured under the ice. Uh, and so she was presented this book, an 1892 in French edition of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne, by the French government, uh, for, her, for her exploits. Um, she had actually traveled 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea on uh, 4 February of 1957. Um, by the way, for those that don't know, a league is usually a uh, unit of measure on land, meaning it's three miles or how far you would walk in roughly an hour. Um, at a comfortable pace. Uh, and C, th it would be 3.4 miles uh, because a nautical mile or three is uh, slightly more than a regular mile. It's uh, 6,000 feet by 5,280. Um, nautical miles are divvied up based off of uh, latitude. Um, and so one minute of latitude is one nautical mile. Um, 60 minutes of, of uh, latitude is equal to uh, one degree, so 60 nautical miles per degree of latitude, latitude being the unit of uh, measurement for uh, uh, going north-south on the globe. So anyway, so that's uh, 20,000 leagues under the sea, and we're going to go on to the exo stateroom here. The exo stateroom, so this is probably the um, smallest of the uh, staterooms uh, for that, that I've seen uh, compared to a modern ship equivalent. Um, the XO uh, on a modern boat might have, uh, by smallest, not by much, as I said, maybe maybe five more square feet, at least on the Los Angeles class that I've served on. Um, the uh, rack here folds up. It might be the first thing you notice. Uh, so the XO normally has its own stateroom. However, if they have a dignitary come on board, 
the EXO would share his space with that dignitary. No one kicks a CEO out of his stateroom. There's only one bunk in his stateroom, and so that wouldn't that wouldn't be uh, uh, the place for the dignitary. It'd be here in the EXO stateroom. Otherwise, that rack gets folded up, and uh, the EXO has a little bit more headroom, and then he can use it as a bulletin board, as you see here. So the EXO runs the ship's office. So he is he is in charge of the yeoman, which is the Navy term for uh, secretary in the Navy. Uh, they do all the office administrative work. Um, office assistant might be a better, better terminology. Uh, at the time it was create, uh, crafted, it would probably be closer to, to that. Um, you can see there, notary. So the office, uh, office is also the uh, notary officer for the ship. Uh, and then if you go over here, you can see here. So the XO and the CAO are communicating constantly, as evidenced by this little pass-through device you see right here. So right there, that would be... Uh, CO telling the XO, hey, your wife called. Uh, XO would pass back and forth, and this folds up. And then on the other side, we'll show you in just a minute, uh, the CO can take it. So that becomes like the CO's inbox and outbox, which the XO controls all that. So the XO is the head administrative officer of the ship. He creates things like the plan of the day. Uh, it is his job to ensure the smooth flow of communication up to the commanding officer from uh, the crew, from all the departments, and uh, to ensure that the administrative functions of the ship do not fall short. Uh, so, once again, XO to fold-out desk there, and the pull-out desk, as you see here. Okay, with that, we're going to go on to the, uh, CO stateroom. CO stateroom is over here, just across the hall. So you see, single bed, as I talked about, the only one who gets his own, own room. Um, there's a pair of dress khakis, uh, over here. So this is an announcing system and phone, so sound-powered phone that we talked about earlier at the engineer's stateroom, uh, announcing system so you can talk to uh, various stations on the boat, uh, the bridge, or just make a general uh, announcement to the crew if he needs to, uh, his own sink obviously. Uh, so he's laying down here, the officer deck can give him a phone call, and he can respond, and he can look up here, and that's going to be a repeater of the ship's course, the ship's heading, and you have the ship's speed would be in that small uh, spot, and then the large circle. Uh, blank would be the uh, ship's depth. So that could all be uh, readily identified by the uh, CO so that he could uh, uh, make sense of the contact report or ship's condition or whatever is being reported to him. Uh, see over here, so he's got a little bit larger desk. Um, that, by the way, is uh, Janice Wilkinson. So that would be Eugene Wilkinson, first CO's uh, wife, a photo of her. Um, and then over here you see a uh, uh, copy of Life magazine from when Commander Anderson was on it featured for uh, having gone uh, to the North Pole on August 3rd, 1958. We'll cover that here uh, in just a little bit. At least one of the forays under ice and then uh, uh, North Pole in a later episode. Over here, by the way, so if you remember from uh, the second set episode, the first one on board, we went to the torpedo room. I showed you the artwork. So that's the actual logo uh, done by uh, uh, Walt Disney with uh, uh, some uh, initial assistance from uh, uh, Mr. Billingdahl. So as you can see there, there's the uh, sign by Walt Disney. So that is the official logo of uh, Nautilus. Now, uh, I'll show, I showed you the pass-through. So over here, here you've got the pass-through. So comes back to the exo side, so pass back and forth. I have not seen that in the boats I've served on, but then again, there is a head, a bathroom in between the CO and the exo stateroom. Uh, they share a bathroom, so that really wouldn't facilitate having a, a pass-through spot there. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to shift back to an interview style like we did last episode, and I'll talk to you about Commander Anderson. See you in a minute. Okay, welcome back. So now we're going to talk about Commander Anderson, the uh, second commanding officer of USS Nautilus. So he was uh, born in Bakerville, uh, Tennessee, in June, uh, excuse me, on June 17th, 1921. He attended the United States Naval Academy, was part of the class of 1943, but due to World War II, he and his classmates were graduating and commissioned about six months early in 1942, to help with the war effort. Uh, he served on board, uh, volunteered for and served in the submarine force and served on board USS Tarpon, SS-175, USS Narwhal, SS-167, and the USS uh, Truda, uh, SS-421. Uh, this is where he was awarded the Bronze Star as Truda was part of an operation to uh, supply uh, guerrilla fighters in the Philippine Islands behind Japanese lines uh, during World War II. Following World War II, he was assigned to uh, the USS uh, Tang, uh, SS-563, and uh, he also commanded USS Wahoo, SS-565, 
uh, Wahoo, uh, renamed from the boat that was lost in, during World War II, uh, went on to serve in action in Korea. Uh, following this, he uh, served as the tactics department head, uh, t uh, the instru head instructor for the Naval Submarine School here in Groton, Connecticut. And then he was assigned to uh, the Atomic Energy Commission's Division of uh, Reactor Development in Washington, D.C., and started working for uh, Admiral Rickover. Um, it is here that he first met the Admiral, um, and he gets down there, and he doesn't really know what to do. And so he asked some people, hey, what, what am I supposed to be doing here? No one's really told me what my job is. And I said, just start studying the manuals right now, figure out some nuclear power and exactly how this works, because no one's been exposed to it at this point in their careers. Um, and then uh, they'll, after you've got your feet under you, they'll, they'll bring you up and give you an assignment. He says, okay, got it, understand. He starts studying. Um, weeks go by. He's had absolutely no instruction as to what he's supposed to be doing. So he at, requests a meeting with uh, Admiral Rickover, and it's granted. Uh, he goes in and says, Admiral, so I've been here for a few weeks. I've been studying these manuals. I really don't have an assignment. What, it is, what is it that you want me to be doing here? And the Admiral says, I don't know. Why don't you tell me what you should be doing here? So he goes, okay, sir. Um, goes back and thinks about it. And decides, hey, I've been studying all these manuals, and I'm, the, I'm looking at becoming a commanding officer or a prospective commanding officer of a nuclear-powered warship. I need to understand all this stuff. But there's no curriculum and there's no coursework to guide my studies. So he says, why don't I come up with that? So he writes up a memo to Admiral. Admiral doesn't hate it, doesn't love it, um, which is kind of the, the neutral is the approval. And uh, so that's what he does. He creates the first coursework for the prospective commanding officer uh, while he was at ANR. Um, while there, he uh, talks to his detailer, which is the Navy term for the person that decides and gives you orders to your next assignment, uh, where it is and when, and when you're going to fill it. Uh, and then uh, talks to him and finds out, yes, you are going to be a, a commanding officer of a nuclear-powered warship. I can't tell you which one. Nuclear-powered submarine, I can't tell you which one. Uh, he says, okay, is it Nautilus? He says, I really can't tell you. But uh, Commander Anderson always wanted to go to the Nautilus ever since he saw her come to life in 1954. He... Uh, Eventually does get orders to Nautilus, um, and he goes, okay, how is it that I'm going to make my mark? Because I can't just rest on the laurels of I'm the first nuclear-powered submarine or I'm on a nuclear-powered submarine. There's got to be more we can do to expand the role and the capability of the submarine force. And he was inspired by uh, Jules Verne and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea with the uh, namesake Nautilus uh, in that story. And as we talked about before, uh, the Nautilus had gone to the South Pole in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Jules Verne didn't know that Antarctica was a continent. No, no one knew it at the time. It's no fault of his. Uh, he thought it was an ice cap just like the North Pole. So he uh, decides, hey, we can do this at the North Pole, though. And there's tactical advantage to this because that's the Soviet Union's backyard uh, is being up under the North Pole. So he says he decides himself he's going to do that. He holds it close to the chest because submariners are very competitive by nature, especially the submarine commanding officers. And if word leaks out that that's what he's looking at doing, somebody else may beat him to the punch. So he holds it close to the chest, leaves in June of uh, 1957 as commanding officer of Nautilus, and then uh, shortly thereafter, that fall, gets the opportunity to, uh, to exercise his plan. He's given orders to proceed to 83 degrees north. Uh, 7 degrees south of the North Pole, 420 miles south of the North Pole. He talks to his boss and says, can I get these orders changed to, say, approximately 83 degrees north? Uh, because that will give him some leeway as to what he actually does. Uh, his boss smiles at him and knows what he's up to and says, uh, yeah, well, I'll work on it. So he gets the orders changed, and uh, his orders are read approximately 83 degrees north with subsequent orders to go to a NATO North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, a NATO naval exercise, and whatever he does with 83 degrees north is not to jeopardize the NATO exercise. He understands his orders, uh, goes back to electric boat where Nautilus is at, and they're doing an upkeep, um, and uh, gets some special equipment loaded on. Uh, and uh, it's a prototype ice sounder. Um, basically, it's a pedometer that's been inverted. So a pedometer is what a ship will use to use a sonar fired in the downward direction, an active sonar pulse fired in the downward direction, and it bounces back and turns and tells you how far away the bottom of the ocean is. Well, if you turn it over, you have to do a couple of other modifications as well, but if you turn it over, you can tell you the distance to the surface. Normally it won't work because you're hitting air and you're not going to get a reflection, uh, a good enough reflection. However, if you're under ice, it's a solid surface there and you can get the reflection. So they use that combined with their known depth in water based off the sea pressure that they have. And they go, okay, so if I know them at, uh, 50 feet, and I, uh, upward sounding, it says it's 40 feet. That means I have 10 feet of ice 
uh, that I have to go through. And that's the rough math that they would do to calculate ice thickness. So all that equipment's loaded out. They get underway. They have an escort, a uh, USS Trigger. To, it's a diesel boat uh, to stand at the edge of the ice pack and uh, uh, offer assistance or at least radio back that they need assistance if they go under the ice and, and uh, have problems. They go under. Everything's going fine. They start off uh, at about 300 plus feet, about 350 feet, going along. Didn't see any issues. Test the pedometers. Come up a little bit shallower but as you get closer. Excuse me, not the pedometer, the ice sander. As you get a little bit uh, shallower, the ice sander works a little bit better. And so they, uh, they start trying to map the underbottom, see what it is, what it looks like. They confirm for the first time that the underside of the ice is not flat, as some people suspected. It's jagged, it goes up and down. Um, and so they're looking at that, and they've been doing that for a while, and they decide, okay, it's time to surface. One of their goals was to develop the surfacing procedure for in under the ice uh, and how to come through. Now, they're not going to surface through ice. Nautilus is not reinforced to do that. She actually has an aluminum sail. She would not be able to surface through the ice uh, uh, way, the way that she was configured. So they're looking for uh, a polynia. We stole the Russian word for uh, thin ice or, or lack of ice. Because um, if you look at the Arctic, uh, it's not just one giant ice sheet. There's uh, little polynias, little holes in, in the uh, ice up there where water is, as well as almost rivers. So it'd be hundreds of uh, feet to hundreds of yards wide and a mile or so long of just water. And you might have a little bit of ice chunks in there, but it's an open break in the ice sheet. And so they're looking for spots like that. They think they've found one. Um, they decide to surface. So they brief the crew what they're going to do. They're on, uh, Commander Anderson's on the scope, and he's on the number one periscope, so the first periscope. Now, modern submarines, periscopes are side by side. On Nautilus, they're in line front and back. So a number one scope in front, number two scope in back. Number one scope is the navigation scope. It's a little bit thicker, um, more robust, has better magnification. Uh, the number two scope is the attack periscope. It's thinner, it's harder to see, um, but doesn't have as great an optic. So they're on the, on the number one scope, and they're going up, and uh, all of a sudden they hear a sickening crunch, and they're about four feet shy of the scope of the excuse me of the sail breaking out of the uh, uh, of the uh, water. Commander Anderson immediately loses all optics in the scope. He knows that number one scope is damaged. He immediately orders negative flood the balance of tanks, uh, uh, buoyancy tanks. Uh, they go down, go down to about 250 feet. Um, he knows that they're not surfacing there now. They figured out that what happened was they were at the edge of where the pedometer could see, by where the sail was. The pedometer wasn't seeing ice, but the sail was, obviously, because it hit it. Uh, and they uh, decide to go a little bit further south, and they're going to find an opening to come back up and uh, uh, survey the damage to the sail. So they start going, they find a spot that looks good, and uh, they raise number two scope. And the optics don't work. They've completely failed. Now they've got a real problem. They have no functioning periscopes on board. So they, they're like, okay, we're going south. They come back out. They find uh, their, their escort vessel, USS Trigger. Um, USS Trigger verifies that the surface is clear of ice and contact so they can surface. And then they go take a survey of the damage. The uh, number one periscope is bent at about a 45 degree angle. Uh, the number two scope is also bent at a little bit more than a 45 degree angle. And the number two scope uh, the head window is completely smashed, and it's the, it means the scope is flooded. Uh, as, that's an issue because now you have potential flooding for the boat through the periscope. Um, so they have to, at a minimum, put a weld on the number two periscope to uh, prevent any uh, water getting in and, and provide some integrity. Uh, but it's completely lost. It can be fixed at a repair shop, but not at sea. Number one scope is only bent 45 degrees, which is significant for steel, but it's otherwise intact. So they look at it. And Commander Anderson knows that if they don't fix the scope, they have to immediately abandon the under ice and go south and find a repair area, probably in England, uh, get to a tender and uh, get the scope fixed so that they can meet their NATO exercise requirements. It's not, it's not a light commitment to go do that. Uh, however, he doesn't want to give up under ice. So he talks to the engineering department and they think they can fix it, at least have a chance. So they get a jack. Um, and they brace it off the number two pair. They, first, they braced it on the sail, but the steel of the scope was beating the aluminum of the sail, and the sail was bending. So they switched to the number two scope, since it was already busted anyway, but at least it's made of steel. And they're able to jack the number one periscope back to, uh, to vertical. Um, hopefully, the optics are aligned. They don't really know yet. They get it back to vertical, but while they're doing that, the, sail cr the, uh, the periscope cracks. And so now they've got about a four-inch crack in the metal. Uh, that they need to fix and is venting the nitrogen out because periscopes are kept at a vacuum so that uh, with charged with nitrogen to keep all moisture out 
because if there's moisture internal to the periscope, it's going to mess with the optics, get condensation on it, the optics won't work anymore, and you can't use the scope. So they've let all the nitrogen out. So now I've got two issues. They've got to fix the crack because it's a source of seawater in it. They can flood the boat just like they could with number two scope. And they've got to vacuum the scope out um, and then charge it with nitrogen. If they have the nitrogen, they've got to figure out how to use the vacuum. We'll get to that in a second. So they send the welding teams up there. Now, this isn't like just welding something in your backyard. This is welding on a rocking ship at sea at the Arctic in the middle of a gale. So they went underwater and it was a little foggy, but otherwise fine. They come back and it's 30 to 40 knot winds, so 40, uh, 35 to 45 mile per hour winds that they're dealing with. Wind chill is below zero. It's so windy, one of the welders, his face mask gets ripped off and blown into the ocean and lost. They send another one up and they start tying the face mask off to the bridge. That way if it gets blown off the face, at least they don't completely lose it. Um, on top of that, it's so windy they can't keep an arc on the weld stick. So they can't actually do the weld. So they have to build a windbreak first. So they build a windbreak, they execute the repair, uh, and go back down below. Meanwhile, they've been doing this for hours. So they are frozen solid pretty much doing this. They get down, everything's fixed there. Now they have to figure out how to vacuum the scope out to put, put a vacuum back in it. One of them comes up with the idea, let's use the condenser. Now, a Nautilus with nuclear power is basically effectively a giant steam kettle. So the reactor heats the water up, that water goes to the steam generator, the steam generator is kept in pipes that, gets, that cools that water, goes back to the reactor, the water in the steam generator takes the heat from the reactor, it turns the steam, goes down the pipes to the turbines, either electrical or propulsion turbines, uh, steam does work in the turbines, um, and then goes into a condenser. A condenser is kept at a vacuum, about 30 inches of vacuum, um, and that vacuum helps it condense back from steam into water. That water gets uh, sent back to the steam generators and it becomes a giant loop. Well, they realize they've got, they've got a natural vacuum creation on board with this condenser. They take some non-collapsible hosing, attach, attach it to the condenser, run that through the engine room and up to the attack center, attach it to the periscope, introduce a vacuum into the periscope, stop, uh, close that off, charge it with nitrogen, do the process again to make sure they get absolutely all moisture out, charge it with a second shot of nitrogen, and then they call the scope good and it worked. Now, They've got their scope back. They decide this could try it again under ice. Um, so they go under. Uh, they don't really have an intention of surfacing this time, uh, uh, but they're gonna, they do have to come back up and make communications with uh, Trigger. They have about a 60-hour communication window so that they uh, know if something happens or if they have to report a uh, submarine in distress. So they're going along. They've also set up an ingenious communications device. So they uh, trigger at the about 12 hours prior to and six hours prior to will drop, drop a depth charge off the side of their ship. Um, which lets Nautilus know their range to trigger because if at the top of the hour they drop it and 10, 15 seconds later, whatever it is, you time it, you hear it, you know the speed of sound underwater, you can determine the actual range to that contact. So they do that um, uh, a couple of times. They make the communications. Uh, they keep going, and then 86 degrees north, they have a complete failure of their heading sources. So they have a magnetic compass and a gyro compass. Both of them, for some reason, no one knows why they, they did it this way, but Nautilus was constructed with them on the same circuit breaker. Well, the circuit breaker tripped, uh, causing loss of both heading sources. So now Nautilus is really driving blind. They're underwater at hundreds of feet with no heading source. They have no, which way, they have no idea where they're pointed. They quickly turn the breaker back on, but now the magnetic compass has a 60-degree swing on it. It's not even pointed at, at true north, it's pointed at magnetic north, which is south of true north, and it's got a 60 degree swing on it. So they're basing their heading off of what they think the middle of that arc is. So if it's swinging from uh, 330 degrees to 030 degrees, then the center is north. Um, the gyro compass has to go through a calibration sequence. The other problem is the gyro compass works great. It's based off the rotation of the earth. It works great at the equator, not so well at the north pole. And no one's ever tried to calibrate a gyro compass at the North Pole before. So they don't know how long it's going to take. And then once it comes back up, they don't know if they can trust it. So they've been dropped in the middle of the ocean, effectively. They think they know which way they came. But they don't know if they're pointed back the way they came because they can't trust their heading source. So eventually the gyro compass comes back. They get to what they think is about 87 degrees north, which is... Uh, 180 nautical miles south of the North Pole, and they're actually able to verify this much later after the fact, uh, after they verify their courses and, and correct it for their error. 
Um, but they get to about 87 degrees north, and Commander Anderson decides, all right, we're done. Even if I get to the North Pole, I wouldn't be able to definitively say if I actually got there or not. Um, we've had this compass failure issue. It's time to, time to call it and come back out. So they turn back, reverse course as best they can. They're driving about 180 due south. Um, and a few hours in, Commander Anderson thinks that, okay, it might be closer to 210, a little bit west, because they're coming towards Greenland. Um, and so they go uh, steer that for a few more hours, and then all of a sudden they get rapidly shoaling waters, which is it means the water depth is decreasing, the floor of the ocean's coming up. They need to turn. Straight is an option, but do you turn right or do you turn left? And if you turn the wrong direction, you could greatly increase the shoaling or run straight into the ground. Commander Anderson guesses left. He thinks east is uh, better water because they're pointed south, so to the left is east. They come left about 90 degrees, start pointing about uh, just shy of due east, and uh, the water drops off. So they're able to get out. They find uh, USS Trigger, come back up, and uh, uh, get a position fix and find out that they have a 40-mile air in their position uh, for where they thought they were. Um, so recover the heading sources. And uh, uh, that was the Nautilus' initial foray under the ice. Uh, served them well. They learned a lot of good lessons for their uh, following trip under Operation Sunshine uh, the following year. And we'll talk about that as we go through the tours. Uh, but uh, Commander Anderson drove that one. Uh, amazing ability by the crew. One of the greatest repairs I've ever heard of at sea is repair of that periscope. Um, and then uh, uh, the resolve that they had to be able to get back out of that situation was, was pretty amazing. Um, Commander Anderson, after this, uh, after his tour, he went on to retire uh, in 1962 from the Navy and uh, ran for an elected to Congress in uh, 1964 and served in Congress from January of 1965 until January of 1973. Uh, so that's Commander Anderson. Uh, we will uh, continue on to talk more about some of the uh, exploit of, uh, of Nautilus under his command with Operation Sunshine as we go on. And I uh, hope you enjoyed today's tour, and uh, thanks for coming.